Okay, looks like we are live. I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's debate on evolution. It is a privilege to have Dr. Dino and Evan here with me to debate the specific question, is there enough evidence to discredit evolution? This is the second last debate this year as we move into 2023 in the Evolution Debate Challenge Series. We have done over 50 of these so far. It's been a wild year. It's been a quick year. It's kind of flown by in, in many ways, but I do look forward to hopefully topping that next year in 2023. So with that, Evan, it is your first time here on the program. And firstly, I do want to thank you for being willing to engage in this important topic and debate. So why don't we kind of break the ice a little bit before we get into the, the fun and opening statement. So let's start with you in terms of a little intro, a little bit about who you are, if you have a channel or a website or anything like that, you know, let us uh, let us know a little bit about it. Evan, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So my name's Evan. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer. Um, we I'm a co-host on Never Game Over. We're a pretty new streaming thing. Um, yeah. Sorry, I completely forgot the rest of your question. I'm kind of, I'm kind of <laughs> in there. You know what I mean? <laughs> No worries. I, I think he answered that. You said you're doing good. Your name's Evan and uh, you're a co-host. You, you checked all the boxes. A co-host on, on a podcast with yes. Kennedy, right? Yes, with Kennedy. Yes. Okay. Well, Kennedy was here last week and him and Kent debated the question is all life related. That was definitely a debate to remember. Lots of fun there. And with that, Kent, good to have you back, brother. How have you been? And a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you. God's been good. I uh, got some of his kids driving me crazy, but God's good. I've uh, been a Baptist preacher 48 years. My dad was electrical engineer. My brother was mechanical engineer. I almost went into that, went into math and science instead. Ended up being a Baptist preacher and taught math and science 15 years. But uh, I, I believe the Bible is true. We've created Dinosaur Adventure Land in Lenox, Alabama, straight north of Pensacola, 70 miles. We have a science center, a museum, a theme park. It's all free. Come on down. We'd love to have you. Especially it's about, we got up to what, 70 today. For you folks up there in Canada, Donnie, do they let you guys you out yet? Are you, are you still slaves to your communist government or can you get out? <laughs> Apparently I'm not supposed to say. <laughs> okay. <you know. laughs> Amen. One day they'll let us out. <laughs> okay. Well, with that, Evan, I think we're just going to hand it over to you and we're going to give you the floor for your opening statement. You've got between 10 to 12 minutes. And I should say, though, for anybody new joining us, check the description box. We've got the... We've got the relevant links if you want to find, uh, you know, Evan's material, Kent Hovind's material over on Ken Hovind uh, Official, but also the uh, the link to the playlist to the Evolution Debate Challenge series. If you're a debate addict, like uh, probably all of us here on the panel, you can find at least over 50 of those just on just on Evolution itself. So again, Kent and Evan, thank you so much for the intros. And Evan, whenever you're good to go, we'll get into some opening statements. You got 10 to 12 minutes. If you need to share screen, let me know. And I can, there you go. Okay. Looks like it is, it is up there. So I will say to the audience, as you get ready, Evan, as always, we're going to have an audience Q&A. So after the opening statements, we're keeping this more uh, free flowing. We'll be discussing the topic for tonight, keeping it on one point at a time for about an hour. And then we'll go through some closing statements and some audience questions. So do your best to please tag me either at Donnie or at Standing for Truth, and that way I won't miss them. So with that, Evan, your uh, your slide shows up on the screen. You're good to go whenever you're ready. All right, cool. Well, uh, it's nice to meet everybody. As I said earlier, I'm Evan. Uh, I studied electrical and computer engineering during my days in university. And apparently I'm here to talk with you all about the evidence against evolution. I'm obviously going to be talking about concepts that are far outside of my specialty. I didn't get into biology because that stuff is hard. And I don't mean hard as in you scratch your head and go, hmm. I mean so hard that everybody I know who went on to study biology would at some point in any given semester break down. I have a lot of respect for anybody who has studied that field to any extent. And that's mostly why I'm here. I think those people deserve a recognition and respect that creationism simply doesn't afford them. So with these things in mind and out in the open, I think we need to get some things straight. 
First, the theory of evolution will never provide a moral framework upon which we can operate. I imagine to some people that feels like some sort of damning admission, but the theory of gravity also doesn't provide a moral framework. Theories about how electricity functions and interacts with matter will also never provide a moral framework. That's because science and the humanities are not the same thing. Morals are something that we create and develop together. For instance, I think it's immoral to put bacon on pizza. I'm sure several of you disagree with that, and you might even start going into some odd rant that I'll never read. But by doing that, you have to acknowledge that we both think something completely differently. There is no hidden truth out there amongst the stars or between atoms that will prove bacon deserves a spot on my pizza. You might claim that Hitler hated bacon on pizza, and that's why he industrialized human slaughter and misery. First off, all right, if you think that way, it's just a bizarre connection to make. And secondly, correlation does not make causation. Any claim that seeks to connect an idea or concept to some real-world event is often manipulating the observer into accepting underlying premises that the listener would otherwise disagree with. For instance, I could claim that the Bible inevitably leads to Hitler-type figures. I could even point to real historical examples of religious institutions using the Bible to justify the slaughter of minorities or those not in a position of power, like the Salem Witch Trials or the Spanish Inquisition or the Crusades or yada, yada, yada. None of those events prove the original assertion that the Bible creates Hitlers. What it does do is make you, the listener, agree that those events were horrific and awful. It's a strategy to prime you to view the Bible as something that brings about bad things. Yet, if I were to ask you if you think the Bible created Hitler, you would still scoff, but in the back of your mind, you would be thinking about those atrocities that happened. That is the power of good rhetoric, and I encourage everyone while we're going through this discussion to point those things out for both Kent and myself. Third, words don't have one meaning. For example, if you aren't academically inclined and hear the term theory, you may think that it contrasts with terms like fact. In one way, you are right. Theory can be synonymous with conjecture, but it can also be with scientific fact. What a theory cannot be is a particular fact. For example, a scientific fact is that dogs have four legs. A particular fact is that your dog got into an accident and lost a leg. That does not mean that your dog is no longer a dog. That particular fact does not disprove the scientific fact either. Your dog is still a dog, and after your dog dies of a long and happy life filled with love and comfort, we can do an autopsy and see that your particular dog at one point in time had four legs. If we were to take your particular dog's skeleton and ship it off to a random university in a random country, then that random student studying anatomy would come up with a hypothesis about whether your particular dog was really a dog because it only had three legs upon its death. That hypothesis would be disproven by looking at the rest of the skeleton of your particular dog and saying that it has the capacity for a fourth leg. That hypothesis could also be disproven by following the history of that dog's skeleton to your mailbox for a brief interview or a picture book would prove your particular dog at one point in time had four legs. At the end of this journey, we would still come back to the same theory or scientific fact that dogs have four legs. Fourth, truth is not derived from feeling. Something that feels like it is all-encompassing and just makes sense is not necessarily true. In the dog example, what if your dog had a birth defect that led to your dog not having rear legs? This might disprove the scientific fact or theory, but what it doesn't do is prevent a new scientific fact from emerging. The first thing a scientist would do upon seeing your particular dog is ask, what makes a dog a dog? The initial theory was that dogs have four legs, yet we know your dog is a dog because its mother is a dog. Therefore, we know that our theory of dog needs to be adjusted. Now, instead of looking just at how many legs there are, maybe now we're looking at the shape of the skull, the number of the teeth, teeth or the type of teeth, the orientation of feet bones, etc. If a dog is ever born without bones at all, then we would need to start asking different questions, looking at different things, things like genetics. The next theory, or scientific fact, might then pose that a dog is a dog if its genetic makeup is within some percent range of the most dog dog. How we would arrive at which dog is the most dog, I do not know. I'm not a biologist and will never claim to be. This entire rant so far has been, on how, has been about how the scientific method grows and develops our ideas about the world and reality itself. After thousands of iterations of ideas and failed hypotheses, eventually they become so complex that to truly understand them, we have to dedicate hundreds of hours of our lives to disprove them thousands. That scope of complexity that we are arriving at can be daunting and make it so much easier to accept the things that just feel right. If you're really interested in standing for the truth, then you need to start questioning everything around you, even the things that make you uncomfortable. You can even start here. Ask yourself, why are you still listening to me? Since this is also a discussion on biology, then another good question would be, 
are koala bears bears? The answer to that one still has me a little bit shocked. For this next segment, I want to show you all a little bit of my engineering work. If you don't know, when you're about to graduate with a bachelor's degree, there's a course you take where you need to prove that your knowledge is up to a certain standard. For an audience of industry leaders and academics who know more about your specialty than you probably ever will. For mine, a partner and I designed this cool thing that you see. It's called the claw. We got the idea when I was walking through a logistics center and didn't feel safe walking in human-only areas because of how many fork trucks came through. All of you looking at this probably have some idea just from gut feelings about which parts move and what all those holes are for. But what you don't know is how this machine operates. You don't even know if it works. Most of you can identify where the motors are, can identify where sensors are, and most of you would hear our presentation and go, wait, what's that do again? Or an actual question we got, so how does it move? I'm not saying this to make anybody in the audience feel less than. This is a tool to show you how something as simple as the idea behind this device can actually appear extremely complex if you don't understand the foundations of the discussion. I haven't even mentioned that it operated off of a motion controller that we designed. This is just the mechanical side. For those of you who squinted at it and went, oh yeah, that's like a claw machine at an arcade, not very cool or interesting. Well, ouch, but also your analysis is likely forgetting that you have no idea how those things work either. They're just familiar and that familiarity is getting in the way of you asking questions and seeking a deeper understanding of what you're looking at. I'm sure everybody here has seen trees like these and I'm sure we all have our own gripes about them. Quite frankly, I'm not a biologist, and the amount of things that I need to understand before I can confidently offer anybody a rebuke or affirmation is staggering. But what I do know is that the scale of time that is being presented, these images are illustrating tens to hundreds of millions of years of change. Sit on your porch for 30 minutes and write down everything that changes within that time frame. The movement of bugs or birds, where the wind is blowing, barometric pressure changes, temperature changes, the position of the sun, if you really think that anything would stay the exact same for a million years, then I'm sorry, I can't help you bridge that gap. There are some things that I am simply not qualified for. To be perfectly frank, if any of you want help understanding these things that come onto our show, never game over sometime. Maybe we can direct you to some reading materials or interviews and speeches that might answer those questions that you have, because I can't answer it. To those who scoff at the idea of the Earth even being a million years old, let alone four billion, I also can't help you. I'm not qualified to tackle the enormity that is that challenge. I'm not a geologist or an archeologist or an astronomer or any other thing that absolutely requires an understanding of the vastness of time. When looking at these images, try to think of the feelings you got when you saw my engineering work, then realize that you were looking at an idea so complicated that the simple, simplified version designed for people like myself and you leaves much to be desired. But that's the point. It's a simplification. You aren't supposed to look at it and immediately see behind the curtain. That's a ridiculous burden that you've placed on people who have much cooler things to do with their time than explain all that this graph entails to losers like myself. I should have a couple minutes left, so I want to briefly talk about something that I think about quite frequently. Probability. Part of engineering is understanding that things can go wrong, and the things we design need to have as low a probability of failure as possible. I'm not going to bring up a kinematics problem and show you what I'm talking about. What I am going to do is present you with a simple problem. Here's a bag filled with five marbles, five white marbles, six red marbles, and 11 blue marbles for a total of 22 marbles. We're going to have you pull out a marble. What is the probability that you have pulled out a green marble? Obviously, there's a 0% chance that you will pull a green marble out of a jar filled with white, red, and blue marbles. But if I ask what is the probability that you pull out a red marble, there's a 27% chance you'll pull out a red marble. Put the marble back and shake the bag. Now draw a blue or white marble. The probability of this instance is the sum of the white marbles and blue marbles divided by the total number of marbles. That's a 72% chance you pull either a white or blue marble. Pretty straightforward. But here's where the cool stuff starts to happen. What if you need to pull a white and then a blue marble? Replacing the marble and shaking the bag after you've drawn it. Well, you have an 11% chance of that happening. What happens if we add and conditions to this statement? Let's say we need to draw a blue and a white and a white and finally a red with replacement in that order. Well, you have a 0.7% chance of this occurring, but that's if we keep replacing that marble. What happens if after we draw a marble, we keep it out? Well, every time you draw, your total sum of marbles decreases by one. So your denominator will get closer to zero with each successive draw. 
Taking that prior example, we see that we have a slightly better outcome than when we replace the marble, a roughly 12% chance of this occurring. If we do that crazy long example again, but this time without replacing the marble, we see the same pattern. Our probability of the same event happening without replacement is actually higher than with replacement. One minute. Now, all of that makes me go, hmm. It implies that in a finite system, over time, the unlikely things begin to become more likely. I personally imagine the Earth as a brown paper bag full of a finite number of these elements, each element representing a marble. Each time these atoms form together into a molecule, it becomes more likely that others will. At the end of the process, we now have a bag full of fused marbles that are still capable of fusing to other marbles. That same process can still happen ad infinitum. With this idea, it honestly makes perfect sense to me that a molecule like DNA can come about, especially when you start going to my specialty, that of electricity and charge. Each element has its own charge, and because of this, certain elements are more attracted to each other than others, those like carbon or, or hydrogen with oxygen. Obviously, this metaphor has its own problems, but that's the thing. Of course, it has its own problems. I'm an engineer talking about chemistry and biology. You can expect perfection, and if you are, I'm sorry to disappoint. I hope you all enjoyed listening to me ramble about dogs, definitions of theory, and then marbles. I hope I said some things that made you go, hmm, and if not, well, that's how it is. Thank you. Evan, thank you so much for that 12-minute opening statement. Now we're going to hand it over to Kent. Kent, we are going to give you a 12-minute opening statement as well. And whenever you're ready, uh, Dr. Hoven, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you so much. I have to confess, I did not, I did not hear quite a bit of that. Uh, it's pretty obvious he was reading a script. Uh, Randa, can we get a better sound here? I, I cannot distinguish the sounds. I don't know what it was, but I heard enough of it to know that if you believe DNA happened by chance, you have lost your marbles for sure. And I've got, got them right here. Okay. So I can help you. I think the probability of anything complex, that you could not get a pencil to evolve over millions of years by chance. So we need to discuss what we mean by a few terms here. Okay, Science is different than other fields of study. Science is from the Latin word seer, which means to know. What do we know? Well, we know cows produce cows. That we know. We see it. Okay. We don't know cows came from an amoeba or anything else. That we don't know. You can guess that. You can believe that. But that's not science. Science is knowledge gained from using observations and experiments to describe the world around us. Okay. Well, they've done experiments. Farmers have been doing these experiments for thousands of years, and they've always discovered corn produces corn and cows produce cows and never anything else. Never anything else. So real science would stop right there and say cows produce cows. Corn produces corn. No exceptions. If you wish to believe cows and corn are related, you now have left science and gone to religion. And I have said for many years, and I'll say it till I die, evolution is a religion. It's not science. It's part of a religion. There's a scientific method that we use to determine if something is really science. Let's make an observation. We see cows producing cows all the time. Okay. Develop an idea. Why does this happen? Well, maybe there's something in the genetics or something. Of course, for generations, they did not even know about genetics, didn't know what gene pool was, but they knew when they crossbred cows, they got cows. And sometimes they could develop cow, a herd of cows that gives more milk or a herd of cows that ha handles the heat better, but they always got cows. So the observation is there must be something in the, in the genetic code that keeps them cow, okay? Let's think of an experiment to test this idea. Let's try crossbreeding the cow with a horse or a pine tree or a porcupine. Won't work. Oh, they only produce cows, okay? Predict what will happen. I predict if you crossbreed any cows anywhere in the world, they will produce a baby cow, calf, every time. Observe. Well, sure enough, it happens every time. I modify the idea as if the prediction was wrong. No, nope, prediction was right. Cows always produce cows. The scientific method is what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. That is science. So it must be something genetic. So we keep breeding them. Baby cows will be cows. They're always cows. Seems to work all the time. Maybe it's a fact that cows produce cows. As far as anybody in human history knows, that's as far as it goes. There are variations within the cow kind, but they're still cow. So they make charts where they draw lines on paper connecting humans and apes back to a common ancestor. This is not science. Apes produce baby apes. Monkeys produce baby monkeys. Orangutans produce baby orangutans. Humans produce baby humans. There are no exceptions to that. 
Now, if somebody wishes to believe they're related because they look similar, that's fine. They can believe whatever they want, but it's not science. Everything they share on these charts, putting a common line between them, is speculation. It's not science. We don't observe humans produce any non-humans, period. No one's ever seen an ape produce a non-ape or a monkey produce a non-monkey. These are just simply lines on paper. That's all they are. And they mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. Should not be part of science. It should be in a religion class, okay? So science, from the Latin word seer, which means to know. What do we know? Well, systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions. Okay, well, let's test it. Let's crossbreed cows and see what we get. I bet we'd get a cow every time. That's what everybody's observed for thousands of years. That's all they've observed. So anything outside of observation is religious belief. Even if it's true, it's not part of science because it's not testable, it's not observable. Religions attempt to understand and explain the world, but religion is not considered a science. I would agree. And evolution is a religion, not part of science. But they try to keep sneaking it into the science class and it's got nothing to do with science whatsoever. How would you define science? Knowledge gained, attained through study or practice. All the practice and study tells us cows produce cows, no exceptions, okay? Science refers to a system of acquiring knowledge. System uses observations and experimentation to describe the and explain natural phenomena. The term science refers to the organized body of knowledge people have gained using that symptom system. All through history, they've observed flies produce flies, cows produce cows, dogs produce dogs. That is all that's ever been observed. So. Do you agree the standard definition of science, knowledge man has attained, accumulated by observation, experimentation, and testing? That is science, okay? The word evolution. Now, this is where it gets tricky. What exactly do you mean by that word evolution? And the topic of the debate tonight is, is there enough evidence to discredit evolution? Well, again, it depends on exactly what you mean. Evidence, the available body of facts or information indicating whether a belief or position is true or valid. Is there enough facts to demonstrate evolution? Well, again, what do you mean by that word evolution? Okay, evidence. What is a simple definition of evidence, of def definition of evidence? A sign which shows that something exists or is true, mm -hmm. like in a robbery. Did they find evidence? Okay, evidence, that which tends to prove or disprove something, ground for belief, proof. Do you have ground for belief? Do you have any evidence or proof that a cow is related to a mosquito? Where well, I'd like to see that evidence. Since we've never seen a cow produce a non-cow, where's the evidence? There are four types of evidence. Lawyers know about this kind of stuff. Four types of evidence. There's real evidence. There's demonstrative. We can demonstrate. I can show you. Gravity. If I drop this, this will fall. I can develop a theory about that. How fast does it fall? And it'll do it every time, over and over again. So I can demonstrate it. There's documentary evidence and there's testimonial evidence, and they have different weights when it comes to trials in court and stuff like that. What are the levels of proof? Three primary standards of proof. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is one, preponderance of evidence and clear and convincing evidence. And the lawyers argue over this kind of stuff all the time. Okay, levels of proof. Sometimes there's no evidence, the guy's not guilty. Sometimes there's a scintilla of evidence, he's still considered not guilty, reasonable suspicion. Probable cause, preponderance, clear and convincing, reasonable doubt. In all of those cases, he's not guilty. You got to have complete. There is no overwhelming evidence for evolution, depending on what you mean by the word. Okay. The process by which different kinds of living organisms are thought to have developed and diversified from earlier forms during the history of the earth. Well, now hold it. History of the earth, if you're going to include billions of years like Evan did, you just went so outside of science because it's not observable. <coughs> there, excuse me. Yeah. So we don't observe it. So you're outside of science when you rely on billions of years for these things to happen, okay? That's not science anymore. Gradual development of something, especially from a simple to more complex form. Has anybody ever seen that? They talk about the evolution of language. Oh, now that's had a lot of intelligent input and sometimes not so intelligent input down in the ghetto, okay? Okay, what's the best evidence of evolution? process of gradual change that takes place over many generations, during which species of animals, plants, or insects slowly change some of their physical characteristics. Well, now hold on a minute. 
Collins Dictionary. Over many generations, in other words, we can't actually see it. There are creatures that have a very short generation time, like certain bacteria. They get, they get born, grow up, get married, and have babies in eight hours. They have a very short generation time. You can see three generations in one day. So let's watch bacteria for a while. And they've done this for years in the laboratory. They've studied thousands and thousands of generations of bacteria and discovered bacteria always produce bacteria. There are no exceptions. So if you, if you wish to believe a bacteria turned to an elephant, that's fine, but don't call it science. There's no scientific evidence for that, okay? Modern definition of evolution. Understood biologic, modern biology, it applies to ecology. Evolution is defined as the change of the inherited traits of a population of organisms through successive generations. Okay, have we observed the traits of humans over many generations? Have we observed any major changes? Uh, I'm not aware of any major changes. You might get some that end up with darker skin or lighter skin or taller or shorter or whatever, but they're all still human and all technically interfertile. So they, they're, they're trying to hide evolution, a descent with modification from pre-existing species. Well, yeah, I descended from my parents who descended from their parents and they went back. I, I come from a long line of parents, long, long line. Okay. And they all were human, every one of them. Okay. Evolution is a process, a continuous branching and diversification. Well, now hold it, Mr. Stephen Gould. You don't know that. That's not science. We don't see things change. Cosmic evolution would have to come first. You'd have to have something, time, space, matter would have to come into existence. I would like Evan, if he'd like to touch on that, where did time come from? Where did space come from? Where did matter come from? To say Big Bang does not answer the question, okay? They say everything squeezed into a dot smaller than a period on a page. That's, of course, physically impossible and absolutely stupid on its face, okay? So we get into, secondly, we have a cosmic evolution. Then we have to have the chemicals have to evolve. We go over those in my seminar. But tonight, for the definition of evolution, I want to get up to where we need to go. The first five meanings of the word evolution are purely religious. I'll get to them in a second. Second law of thermodynamics, let's see. I got way too many slides in here and only a minute and a half left. All right. Uh, I have 8,000 slides in this presentation. It would help if you ask the questions in the same order I have the answers, okay? Okay. I say the six different meanings to evolution. Cosmic, there's no evidence for that. No, no scientific evidence. Chemical, where the hydrogen changes to something else, there's no scientific evidence to hydrogen change into gold, silver, and platinum. Stellar, stars evolving, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. Nobody's ever seen a star form. Then we have to have organic evolution, where life has to get started. Nobody's ever seen that one. Let me get up here. Man, I got more slides than I thought in this one. Uh, the organic evolution. How did life get started? There's no scientific evidence that life can start from non-living material. All the experiments say it can't happen. And if a bunch of scientists do make life in the lab, that would prove it takes intelligence to make life. Wouldn't prove evolution. So then you have to have macroevolution where an animal changes to a different kind of animal. And nobody has ever seen that. It just simply isn't observation. It isn't. It isn't science. And that's the purpose of the debate tonight. Is there enough evidence to discredit evolution? If by evolution you mean the whole real theory, all six meanings, yes, there's plenty of evidence. It doesn't happen. It's never been observed. It's belief. It's a religion and nothing more. So I stand my ground. I think evolution is nothing but a scientific religion, a religion masquerading as science. Your floor. Okay, there we go. Thank you so much, Kent, for that 12-minute opening statement. That, uh, that concludes the opening statements for the debate. To the audience, I am all up to date on the questions so far that you've sent in. So please, during the discussion, make sure to uh, continue tagging me, and I'll save your questions for the audience Q&A. So with that, we are jumping into the free-flowing discussion portion of this debate. Evan, why don't we allow you to pick the first uh, point or topic to discuss since Kent just ended with his opening statement. So Evan and Kent, the floor is yours, gentlemen. All right. So Kent, I, I honestly love your, your presentation. I think it's really, really good. Uh, you can toss that out there. Thank you for sharing. Uh, my first question, though, is like, what do you what do you mean by not observable? Like, as in if you close your eyes and turn off clocks, the time doesn't exist or... Donnie, I'm still not understanding him. Something's wrong with the audio. Rando, fix it. I cannot understand what he is saying. <clears throat> so, Evan, my recommendation mm -hmm. is 
to, I, I guess, talk closer to the mic. But I did, I, I did turn up your volume to one thirty. When I turn you up too much, it creates an echo. I'm curious if you go into your settings. So I, I'm going to pause the timer for now and just see if we can uh, figure something out. Because are you using an external mic or your laptop mic, Evan? External. You are okay. So I want to make sure that the external is hooked. So if you click the settings and go to audio. So it'll be right under, you got general, camera, and then audio. Click the drop down box on the mic where, where you see the arrow and just make sure that the external mic is, is connected and not your laptop mic. I believe default, I believe would be like your, your computer mic, but if you want an mm. external. Hold on this one. How's that any better? Still pretty much the same. Which one did you click? I went from my webcam to my, oh, hold on. Oh, okay, so, so it was on your webcam one? Yeah, oops. For me, it says ping. So I use an external mic. So it says microphone, USB, ping, audio device. That's what I have checked on. So if you have a, an external mic, it should be something similar to that. It should be USB or um, some kind of audio device. If you're using your webcam mic, the sound's not very good at all. I'm pretty sure there's only a few choices, so we can just go down the list and try them each. <laughs> so maybe click another one and then we'll test it. Okay, now I'm not hearing you at all, so let, we're definitely not gonna use that one, so let's try another. <laughs> I did hear something, Evan. Try and um, give us an audio test now. Everything should be connected. Not sure. Okay. Why. Okay. Leave it on what it is now, but just try and speak up. I've got you up at one one thirty, okay. and um, and and we'll go from there. Because at this point, this is I think as good as we're gonna go. Yeah, I'm gonna try to turn off echo cancellation. It might be causing some issues with my mic's um, own settings. No, you're coming in good now. I, I would just recommend speaking up a little bit when, when you're asking Kent questions. So okay. let's try now. Try If you could reiterate your, your first points that you made and um, if, if you could re-ask uh, the question. So I'm going to start the timer now. And okay, here we go. Okay, can you hear me, Kent? Is this like a good volume? <clears throat> yes, sir. Sounds good. Okay. So... Um, I don't know if you heard this. I uh, complimented your presentation. I think it's a really good one. Um, Wait, I, did, I didn't understand a word of that. Say that again slower. You calculated the age of the earth to be what? <laughs> I, I was just complimenting your presentation. I think it's a really good presentation. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was just going to ask, uh, what do you mean by observable? Like, do you mean like if you close your eyes and turn off the clocks, then time doesn't exist? Or what do you mean by that? Well, science deals with things we can observe. What do we see? And there's different ways to know things through our eyes. We have five senses that lead into our brain, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. And mm -hmm. so where is, those are the only evidences we can really go by uh, as far as science goes. You can observe when you can watch when you crossbreed cows, they produce a cow. Now you can imagine in the brain, you can think about and imagine that it was different in the past, but that's no longer observable science. Well, hold, so on, I think hold, on, hold on, hold on. I just want okay. to be specific here to like focus on this one thing. Um, when we're talking specifically about time, if we close off all of our senses, we put ourselves in a deprivation tank, if you will, does time still exist? If we oh, remove yeah. our ability to observe it, is it still there? Yeah. Time does not stop for us, okay? It doesn't care about okay. us at all. Time. So then you acknowledge then that things happen outside of our immediate perception, right? Correct. Lots okay. of things happen Do you happen agree outside, but... that the things that we may not be able to see leave traces that we can then see later on in time? Sometimes they do. Yep, you're right. I could okay. walk through the woods and find a tree that fell down five years ago. I didn't see it fall, but I, I would conclude it fell. Exactly. Now, one way, okay. speaking of trees, one way that I know that we can track time is by looking at the rings on a tree. 
Now, obviously, you're not going to find a tree that's a million or a billion or four billion years old, but you are going to find a tree that's quite old. Do you agree that you can track the passage of time through tree rings? No, sir. It's been de demonstrated hundreds of times that trees, trees, the tree rings are seasonal. You can get really? a, a okay. you, can, well, you can get a big ring in the spring when you get a lot of rain. Have a dry summer, produce a hard ring. Have a wet fall, produce another soft ring. Trees but the rings are still there, and you can still track the yeah. progression of time yeah. through them, right? Well, the rings are there, but they're not necessarily annual rings. They might be. I didn't say they were annual. I just said you can see the passage right. of time. Yeah. I, I would say the outer ring was produced after the one under it. I think there's a sequence that I don't think that's that could be undone, but they're not necessarily annual. And the oldest tree ring count is about you know 4,500 years, mm -hmm. which would that well the bible would say there was a flood 4400 years ago and of course some trees might have survived the flood some parts of the world might have only been underwater for a few weeks long enough to drown everybody noah's in the ark for a year but that mm -hmm. doesn't have anything to do with the flood covering the earth for a year so sure i think the, a lot of trees would have survived the flood and so we may have trees with you know four five six thousand rings because uh, the bible see teaches the earth is six thousand years old but that's not the purpose of the debate tonight how would the tree rings be evidence for evolution though Oh, so what I'm doing is I'm trying to set up that we can observe time changing in the natural world around us. We don't have to always immediately perceive something for it to exist. Right. 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 I don't have to. I, all observe, all humans in the history of the world have ever observed. Nobody's ever reported their cow producing a non cow. If mm -hmm. you know of one, I'd like to see it. So that's why mm -hmm. I would say the collect, collective observation of all of humans, all farmers in the world says you plant corn, you're going to get corn. No exceptions. Right. You know so just to continue on with the tree, though, if I plant a tree today, then we can say that 10 years from now, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, if that tree is still there, that we're going to be able to track its life when we cut it down to look at its rings, right? We, we can sorry, speculate on that, right? That's why I said. The rings are not always annual. They generally are. I didn't say they were annual. I said we could look at them to determine that time passed. Right. We can speculate that that tree will have rings 200 years from now and we can track the passage of time through it, right? Okay. Okay. So that observation and that speculation from your argument is impossible. Evolution is not saying that a cow is going to give birth to a scorpion. It doesn't say that. It says that if you take a cow and you subject it to a different environment from which it has come about in over a long period of time, if you change its material conditions for a significant portion of time, then that cow will express variation. You see this in coloring. You see this uh, when farmers uh, breed, specifically breed them to have a higher muscle content or thinner hides to make them easier for butchering. Every, every part of this is observable immediately and through speculation of the future and the past. So I'm just confused. Like, what, what do you fundamentally mean about observation? Because if we can observe that time passes, then we can also apply that to other processes. I'm just curious where you draw the line on that. Okay. We can observe farmers have produced a variety of cows and we've, dis we've observed that they seem to hit a limit. They've been trying to get cows to give more milk. I was in Kankakee, Illinois and got to meet the record cow milk giver that year. 100 pounds a day the cow gave. Do you think they will ever get a cow to give 10,000 tons of milk a day? Do you think that is, or is, is there a limit someplace? You know what, man? I have no idea, but I think it would be cool if we could get a cow that could produce that much milk. That'd be nuts. But you know what? There, there. I will concede that there is probably a limit to what a single animal can do. Very but true. I didn't say that you can breed animals to produce an infinite amount of produce. Never made that claim. Okay. Do you believe a single-celled creature, like this textbook shows, a single-celled creature produced the human body with 100 trillion cells. Average I mean, are you body. asking me if you can count the individual cells? Well, the, 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 current estimate is, well, the current estimate is that the average human has 100 trillion cells in their body. Okay. Do you think, do you think a single cell creature evolved into the humans, which have 100 trillion cells? Do you believe sure. that? Over the course of billions of years, yeah. That's where it's not science. You don't observe that. We never see um, an amoeba or a protozoa produce anything other than it's protozoa. Sure, so because, in, because the process to take a single cell organism and turn it into a multicellular and then a multi 
system organism is extremely complicated and takes a huge amount of time and resources. I have no doubt that in the future we might be able to, to create those, uh, those systems that could make it immediately easy to observe that. Right now we don't. All we can do is look at the tree and say, hey, time has passed. We can see the changes that have happened. We specifically are able to breed bacteria in such a way that they're more efficient at producing things. For instance, the bacteria that produces insulin, nowadays it produces it more cheaper because they're more, less expensive, I guess, um, than it did in the past because we have bred them so that their byproducts are higher in efficacy and quantity. If you think that we can't use the tools that evolution provides to change the world around us and our markets fundamentally, then I don't understand what you're talking about. Well, evolution is not providing any tools. That's a human genius or human mind saying, wow, if I do this, I can get that. Yeah, I think you a could human genius created the theory of evolution and the theory of evolution has within it tools that we use to modify organisms to sate our appetite. I don't understand where your what your position here is. Right. I know you don't understand my position. I'm trying to explain it. What we've observed is bacteria produce bacteria. They mm -hmm. might get uh, some some human genius might say, wow, I could take these creatures that are already living and extract something from them that would help, you know, develop a vaccine or bacteria or, or antibiotic or something like that. But see, this is still it's not changing anything like they've taken cows and got cows to give more milk. However, those cows that give more milk would not survive in the woods. You have to babysit them. You got to guard them because the hey, now else. hold on, hold on a second. This is key. This is fundamental. If you take that cow that can't produce that that can't survive if it produces that much milk, and you put it in the woods for a couple generations, let's say they survive the first four. What do you think is going to happen over time? Do you think they're going to produce gonna, less milk, or are they going to produce the same amount of milk? They're going to go back to the normal average wild cow. Oh, so then you acknowledge then the natural selection is a normal process. Thus, That's evolution it. itself is a normal process. Oh, no, no. Don't, don't confuse the two. Natural selection has nothing to do with evolution. Natural selection, oh. natural selection, look, look at me. It selects. It doesn't create anything. If a, if a cold winter comes through and all the animals that don't have long fur die out, after a few generations, all the creatures have long fur, like the coyotes or the wolves up north. They're much bigger than the coyotes down here in Alabama. Nature selects. It doesn't create anything. If I went through and selected everybody over six feet tall to survive and killed everybody under six feet tall, after eight or 10 or 15 generations, nearly everybody would be over six feet tall. I didn't create anything. I selected a slice of the already existing gene code. If I wanted to use that process, to create a race of humans that are 4,000 feet tall, it wouldn't work. There's a limit. You guys don't understand or don't admit there's a limit. Sure, things vary within limits. They've got 400 species of cows now, and they had a common ancestor called a cow. But you want to have kids learn a chart like this in the textbook that says cows came from an amoeba and are related to a ladybug. Do you believe you, Evan, are related to a ladybug? I mean, if we go far enough back in history, if you acknowledge that time is extremely vast, then yes. But if you don't, then that's a ridiculous assumption. I talked about that type of tree in my intro, which unfortunately you couldn't read, so I'll, I'll call my tone down a little bit. I apologize. Those things are simplified versions of extremely complex ideas. You know, you can't look at something like that and expect to like peek behind the curtain of reality. That's not how that functions. You know what I mean? Like, if I start talking about electrical theory and then you start digging me on stuff, of course you're going to find things that I've got wrong because I've simplified it for the audience. That's exactly what that tree is. Each of those lines represents more time than you can comprehend. Your brain doesn't have the processing power to understand the vastness of that time. The period between seconds is so immensely vast to some processes that it is essentially an infinite amount of time. You can't like, you can't look at this image and then make some conclusions from it. It's not beneficial. It's pointless. So if the frog turns to the prince quickly, it's a fairy tale. But if the frog turns to the prince slowly over billions of years, now it becomes science. I'm, I'm sorry. What? In a fairy tale, the frog turns to the prince as soon as you kiss it. 
Well, that, that's the thing. It's a fairy tale. I agree. And so is evolution. Adding time is not going to help. Adding time makes it worse. Okay, but earlier you acknowledged that over time, if you change an environment, the creature, the species, will exhibit change because of natural selection. You acknowledge exhibit, that. Right, but they will only exhibit change within the limits of their already existing gene code. Cow, uh, wolves can get thicker fur because they already have the genes to make fur. Fish don't have that gene. Okay. So why are you like limiting it to just like fur length and thickness? Why, why can't it be maybe over the course of 10 million years, the position of their feet bones change, the way their ligaments operate change? Maybe, maybe a wolf, because of the environment it's in, needs to be better at climbing trees. Would it not be reasonable that it, over a huge amount of time, develop adaptations that make it better at climbing trees? I never said well, evolution would create anything. You're right, it is selecting traits that are preferable. And in this environment I just created, a wolf able to climb trees is pretty great. Well, this again is your imagination. This isn't observable science. We don't sure, see- Sure, I wolf. created a, a, a hyperbole, a metaphor. Right. So this is why it's a fairy tale for grownups. The whole evolution religion is nothing but a fairy tale for grownups. So hold you on, want to add what, do you, what do you mean by religion? Something you believe in without scientific evidence. There's no scientific evidence of a wolf ever producing anything other than a wolf. There's no scientific evidence. Nobody's ever observed this. So you believe these charts right here, you believe the, the raven and the human and the pine tree I'll go, ahead, go back to a common ancestor. That's what they teach the kids. They teach them all the many forms of life on earth today are descended from a common ancestor. That's not science. This doesn't belong in a biology book. This belongs in a religion book found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. They make these family trees and put humans are related to seaweed and sharks are related to seaweed and to starfish and octopus. This isn't science. Now, you, you've mentioned many times already so tonight that time, vast amounts of time, is going to somehow solve the problem. So you're an engineer. Would you agree? Would you agree that the earth we're on is spinning yep. once, a day, once a day. Would you agree that there are quite a few factors that would tend to slow it down? Any spinning object is going to slow down. We have tides washing up, on down the, up and down on the beach, creating tidal breaking. We have Coriolis effect winds going against the mountains. We have lunar drag. We have the internal friction with a liquid core and a solid crust. Spin a ball full of water, it'll slow down fast, okay? So we have, they know it's been demonstrated and observed and timed, the earth slows down about a thousandth of a second every day. That's why you can Google leap second. Every uh, thousand days or so, three years, they have to, or a year and a half maybe it is, they have to add a second to the clock. The clocks go off by a second because the earth is slowing down. Nobody argues about this that I'm aware of, but what they don't go on and take the next obvious step, if the earth is slowing down, it used to be going faster. You want to go back billions of years, now you got a problem. Because the earth would be spinning so fast, it would flatten out like a frisbee. Everything would fly off the earth at some point. You get going fast enough. You can't have billions of years. Now, you might need billions of years to imagine that the wolf came from a, you know, a protozoa, but that's your imagination. And if I take away time, it's just like pulling the pacifier out of a baby's mouth. You have to have billions of years for your theory to even begin to look reasonable. I don't think it looks reasonable with any amount of time. But I could give you 30 or 40 scientific indicators. You can't have billions of years. The sun is up there burning right now. It's losing 5 million tons every second. It's burning up its fuel. It's losing about 5 feet every hour in diameter. Google it. The sun is burning, and it's losing fuel, and it's losing diameter. Now, it oscillates for multiple reasons, but the oscillation is generally towards shrinkage. Over long periods of time, it shrinks 5 feet an hour. Do the math. We're 93 million miles from the Earth on average, 92.5 at perigee and 93.5 at apogee. We're, we're, but the sun used to be bigger. And if the sun used to be heavier, add 5 million tons a second to the sun. And pretty soon you go back in time, you got a problem because the Earth and sun are attracted by their masses. And that would, they'd, they'd snap together like two magnets. Mm -hmm. So I'm, Evan, there, there are hundreds of ways I could demonstrate to you, you don't have billions of years. So even if it could happen, there's not enough time for it to happen.
these charts, these things they put in the textbooks are pure imagination. You don't have enough time. There's no observation of, it, of these changes, and, and there's not enough time for it. So the Earth is spinning. Google that. The sun is burning. Google that, or go, of course, go outside and look at it. If you, you know, you never get to see it up there in Ohio. So uh, it, it's burning. The, so everything. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you. I just, I just have a couple okay. of points here. So, all right, a part of the whole idea of things happening over the course of billions and billions of years is that things have obviously changed, right? You touched on the fact that the sun is shrinking, right? That process, what's happening is the hydrogen molecules, the uh, protons and neutrons are actually fusing together to create denser and denser um, molecules, right? What eventually happens is that those suns begin to get so dense that they're no longer able to radiate energy. So what happens is a couple options. You know, I'm not an astronomer, so I, I'm not exactly a good source for this. But to my understanding, there are only a couple things that can happen. One is a black hole and the other is that the star explodes. We've observed observed stars exploding. When we uh, just a couple years ago watched them actually two suns merge. It's a natural process that happens. Your assumption that if we go back far enough in time that the earth will be so fast that life can exist. Yeah, that is true. I never said that life has always existed on earth. There was a period of time where no life existed on earth. I didn't say that it became a disc. I sincerely doubt that. I doubt it was ever moving that fast. I mean, to get a ball with that much mass to flatten into a disc would be ridiculous. But you know, that is what it is. But also, the position of the Earth relative to the sun has also changed over the course of those billions of years that these two terrestrial bodies have existed, right? The Earth hasn't always been here. As a matter of fact, the Earth doesn't have a perfectly circular uh, orbit around it. I forget the term, but it's more oval shaped, right? And over time, we actually get closer and closer to the sun because that's how that works. So your position that if we go far enough back in time, that life doesn't exist. I agree. It wouldn't because the conditions wouldn't be right for it. And um, that stars and stuff do something. I'm not really sure where you're going with that. Can you Can you add on to that? Well, I'm just simply pointing out, if I told you this ink pen was 8,000 years old, you could say, come on, Kent, it's made out of plastic and they weren't developed till World War II era. It can't be more than 70 years old. Okay. Oh, well, it says BIC on here. Wow, BIC wasn't even a corporation until 1946. I just proved it's not billions of years old. It's more like less than 1946. Oh. I bet through various scientific means, I could demonstrate the claim of 8,000 years for this ink pen is wrong. I don't know when it was how made. How would you go about that process, though? How do you think? You, look, what's your hypothesis for how you would go through that? Let's test this out. Somebody makes a claim. This is eight thousand years old. I would like sure. to disprove that claim. I think I could easily disprove their claim. It's not eight thousand mm -hmm. years old. Okay, mm -hmm. you're making a claim that the universe is billions of years old. I think I can disprove that. It can't be billions of years old because where'd this energy come from to get it spinning? You know how big and how heavy the earth is to get that thing spinning? Talk about a fat lady on a merry-go-round. Try to okay. get that thing spinning. But there's things about like relative mass here that you're kind of ignoring. When terrestrial bodies collide or simply exist, they're going to move. Because if you imagine space as like a blanket and you drop like a heavy mass onto it, it's going to pull down, right? And that is going to create a point of high potential and a point of low potential. And as that ball, the terrestrial object, like for instance, the Earth, starts to get closer and closer down to that, it starts to spin faster and faster and faster. You can observe this effect when you drop a penny into those little things at the mall. It's the exact same process. So like, what are you getting at there? Where's this blanket out in space? Has anybody ever seen that? And who dropped it? And who created it to begin with? To have an Earth just drop into a blanket and start spinning, I understand what you're talking about there. I taught physical science too. But this doesn't explain the origin of A, the origin of gravity, who made gravity? You know, what on earth is gravity? Give me a jar of that. But where did gravity come from? And who made the planets? We've never seen, you mentioned about stars exploding. I agree. It's a mm -hmm. nova or the big one, it's a supernova. Show me one forming. All we see are stars blowing up. That's the opposite of evolution. It's not gonna create anything. Everything is degrading, it's winding down. 
the earth is slowing down, the oceans are getting saltier, the sun is burning out its fuel, everything is winding down, it's not winding up. Where's this energy coming from? I mean, you studied physics in, if to become an electrical engineer. The, it's obvious the first and second and third laws of thermodynamics apply to everything. There isn't enough time for your theory to be true. If you wish to believe it, great. I welcome you. I, you're, you're welcome to have your religion. Let's see, slide number 311. Okay. But these charts are not science. These are philosophy. They are religious belief. You don't see any reason to connect these lines. Let's see, they got a line drawn here between a shark and a, a fern. Do you, do you understand there are differences between a shark and a fern? Yeah, Lots of differences. But I'm sure if you go back in time far enough and you start to look at their common ancestors, eventually you get to a point where they were the same entity and then their environments changed and things happened. Like when we take the wolf and we put it on an island, you know? But like, just to get off this for a second, you keep saying that evolution is a religion. I'm just curious, if it's a religion, then who is its god? Or gods, if it's polytheistic? You've mentioned it 30 times tonight. Your god is time. Time can okay. accomplish anything. But hold on, man. If time is a god, then it has to be the most insidious and pervasive god. You can't find a religious text that does not use or rely heavily upon its tenets. In the beginning, so says Yahweh. You cannot operate in any society without relying on its consistency. How do you farm without it? How do you pay your taxes? How do you plan your day? If time were a god, then you would worship it. You know, like, where is it? Where, where is the god of time worshipped? What church? Time is an accepted well, theory that makes you uncomfortable. So instead of wrestling with that, you were instead relying on your definition of religion to make my positions look as ridiculous as flat earthers. It's disingenuous and ridiculous. Well, first place, I'm not a flat earther, okay? Kansas is flat. The rest of it is round, okay? So don't put me in that category. Part of um, Nebraska is flat, too, okay? But no, the earth is round. It's a big ball, of a little about almost 8,000 miles in diameter, and it spins about 1,038, 7.6 miles an hour at the equator. I'm very familiar with all this stuff. I charter science. But, so I don't put me in the flat earthers. The time, you, you have mentioned 20 or 30 times tonight that time could solve the problem. How did this amoeba turn to a shark? Well, over millions of years. Now, you may not worship time. Out, you don't realize you're worshiping time. But in your mind, time answers all the questions for you. How on earth could an amoeba turn to all these creatures? How can a protozoa turn to a bird, a biology teacher? Well, given enough time, that is you your keep, God. You keep like ignoring the addendum that I added to that. It's time and a change in material condition. It's a change in environment that requires the species to adapt to its new environment. You can't, you can't just keep ignoring these things that I keep adding onto it and saying the same things over and over. We're going to keep going in circles. Okay. Well, I agree. All creatures that we know of, all living organisms, are able to adapt to their environment within certain limits. Some humans have adapted to live up in, you know, 10 below zero weather. They've learned to, you know, how to fix clothing and make it work. Some animals have adapted to living where it's 10 below. Thicker fur, thicker fat layer, uh, shorter legs, bigger body mass. You think they'll ever adapt to 400 below zero Fahrenheit? No, Depends. there's a limit. Oh, okay, well, you can believe that. Some, some uh, people have adapted to living in Sahara Desert conditions at 120 degrees. They, could, they, could they ever adapt to living in 2,000 degrees? So here's like, there's like an underlying thing that you're doing here. The person who lives in the Sahara, if you give them time to adjust, can also live in the area that's 10 below zero, right? That isn't, that isn't a biological adaptation. That is a human system adaptation. Humans are really good at doing that. We build systems to prolong and make our survival easier. It's just what we do. So that doesn't really fit. But if we instead just focus on an animal that doesn't create systems to survive in harsh environments, then you know what? You're not going to take a polar bear and drop it in the Sahara and it's going to survive. It's just not going to. But right. if you instead take that polar bear and put it in an environment that's close to the one it came from, but with some variation, and over time as it gets used to that environment, 
you change it again and you keep doing that and doing that and doing that and doing that. Eventually you get to a point where you're operating with a completely different species of bear or not even a bear at all. If your time period is long enough, you see the exact same process happen again, when we're dealing with bacteria, we specifically breed them to do specific things. We change their environmental conditions to make that happen. Well, let's take the bear as an example. You can Google it. There are now eight different varieties of bears, black bear, brown bear, polar bear, grizzly bear, et cetera. Okay. Sun bear. They're still bear. They uh, are, they uh, live in different environments and polar bears uh, don't really like the really hot weather. And the brown bears and black bears down here don't really like the cold weather, but they could probably live there, but they're still a bear. But see in your religion, this, if this process of diversifying into eight bears is what changed an amoeba to a bear. That's not science. It's a religion. You believe that. There are, let's take dogs as a more common example. There are the dingo, the dogs that love to live in the desert where it's hot. The dingo has thin body, short fur, long legs, get away from the heat of the desert sand, and it seems to thrive in hot weather. Put those in the Alaska, they wouldn't survive. Then you have the thick body, long fur, short legged creatures, the coyotes or wolves. They, they can handle the cold weather, but they couldn't handle the desert. There are now 339 recognized breeds of dogs. They might have had a common ancestor called a dog. But you, but you believe a dog and a pine tree have a common ancestor, don't you? Yeah. If you go back far enough, if you look at the material conditions that the species went under to arrive at the positions that they're at today, then sure. There's your God. If you go back far enough, time can solve the problem. You don't understand you it, Evan. Keep, you, don't. you keep that doing is. this. You have to include the material condition part or it doesn't make any sense. And I've already responded to the time is the God thing. You kind of just blew past it. Like, let's focus on one thing here, right? I brought okay. up the bear example. And then you then that. said the exact same thing I said with dogs. But you just made it sound ridiculous by ignoring all of the other things that I added onto it to make it make sense. Well, and like that's ridiculous. cool. You know, like if you don't get it, it's okay. You don't have to. But I, I let's get be it. honest about it. what we're actually replying to and responding with and not ignore each other. Can we do that, Ken? Okay. What I understood of your question or comment was uh back to the topic. Is there enough evidence to discredit evolution? You believe dogs given enough time, could have a common ancestor with pine trees, I would simply say there's no scientific evidence for that. All we've observed in all of human history is dogs produce dogs and they produce a variety. They've now developed little bitty teacup chihuahuas, completely useless, would not survive two minutes in the wild on their own, but they're dogs. They're still dogs. They've now got Great Danes and Mastiff, huge dogs, but they're never going to get a dog as big as an elephant even though there are animals as big as an elephant, like an elephant. So why don't they get a dog as big as an elephant? There's a limit somewhere in the gene code for dog. There's a limit between Chihuahua and Great Dane. They're still dog. Would and that be because dog. species aren't kinds? Would, would that maybe be it? I, I, and I'm not trying to sound derogatory. Sorry, I'm a little amped up right now. Let me cool off for a second here. You think that over time, a dog will always be a dog. That's not that's my a, position. That's that's a straw man that you're putting in. And I'm not sure if you're doing it intentionally or if it's because that's your frame of reference. So is it your frame of reference or is it intentional just before I go on? I, I am claiming that all of human history has demonstrated scientifically dogs produce dogs. You believe by faith with time, the dog came from an amoeba. That's not science. Okay. And I wish you so quit calling it science. Now we're ignoring each other's it. questions. So I'm just going to go on. If... We acknowledge that we can observe things happening over time. If we acknowledge that variation in environment over prolonged periods of time can cause change in species, then we also have to acknowledge that over longer periods of time with enough variations in material conditions, then we will start to see new species emerge. I've never said that you'll never see a new species. Obviously, there is a limit to what a dog can do genetically. But eventually, if you continue to constrain its environment in such a way, it becomes no longer a dog. The way we define dog is a biology process through countless hypotheses and experimentations. You can't just ignore all of these processes and pretend like you're saying something 
factual. You're ignoring everything that happens in that process. Okay. I, I can't you. tell if it's because your frame of reference is biblical and that you are examining the animal kingdom as a series of kinds as opposed to a bunch of species. So which okay. is it? Evan, we got about eight topics going at once here. Okay, let's take, don't, let's, take let's not do that. Let's be kind with each other. Let, let's not try to make each other look like we're gish galloping and being awful. What, let's just be chill what, here. One, which one is, topic at a time. Okay, one topic at a time. Over history, humans have, a, have been able to develop varieties of dogs that have a particular trait. Somebody wanted a hunting dog, so they developed a dog that has a better sense of smell, and they gradually get really, you know, good hunting dogs. They're still dog. The dog already had smell, but they mm -hmm. just de decided to uh, focus in on that trait or obedience or size or whatever. Um, it's like, but you said, you said if it was enough time, it would no longer be a dog. This is where you just stepped out of science into what you believe. This isn't observable. Nobody's ever been able to produce a non-dog from dogs. So it's not science. Science is what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. Where's the science for evolution of something changing to a different kind? They're still dog. My wife has a pug. It's barely a dog, but they call it a dog. She paid money for it. I think that was a grave mistake, but she did, okay? So I, I, it's just out in the wild, that thing wouldn't last 30 minutes. It, it barely lasts with me feeding the dumb thing every day, okay? So the, the point is, it's still dog, and that's all we've observed. Evan, science is what we can see, test, demonstrate, study. Show me a dog produce a non-dog. Show that to me. Okay. Give me a second here. I need to I need to formulate a response to you on the fly. So let's say I'm going to keep it thematic, but I'm going to create a, a metaphor here. OK, so I'm just going to lay that out there beforehand. Let's say today we start a project to build some great thing and it's going to take 600 years to build. Obviously, it will be finished long after you're dead. Does right. that mean that that thing won't exist in 610 years? No, it, they take a long time to build it. This American so infrastructure. If we were to make a project of taking a dog and turning it into a different species by continually selecting its environment and material conditions, we can then say or predict, predict, that's a key term there because you're right. Science is a process of testing hypotheses. It's never definite. You can prove this wrong. But if we were to make it our project and we were to put a timestamp on it of 2 million years, do you think if we were to continually do those things that we would not have a new species? Well, there you go with the word species. We've thrown something else into the mix. Species is I a biological term. You keep going back to kind because it is your frame of reference. I brought this up a couple times because I want to make sure our terms are clear. Are you using kind or are you using species? They are not intermixable. They are completely different. Which right. are you there using? Are, there are 27 different definitions of species that I have found in the different We're dictionaries. Using the biological one, the one that the biologists use and the zoologists use. That's right. the one we're using. In the Bible, it says if they can bring forth, they're the well, same. We're not talking about the Bible. We're talking well, about science. Right. Okay. If your well, frame of reference is kinds, then we need to get you to use species. We need, okay. We need to I move think past kind, yeah. because otherwise evolution is not going to make sense if you're using biblical terms, because they're biblical well, terms. The animals do not care how we classify them. If no, we they don't. Turn off, okay. We have a bunch of animals here on our farm. We have chickens. We have ducks. We have goats. We have uh, pigs. If we turn them all loose together... The pigs do not even consider mating with the chickens. They look for another pig, okay? The chickens, they know what kind they are. Now, there are 27 different definitions of species that I've been able to find. There's never been a good solid definition of exactly what is a species. Is a dog and a wolf a different species? Yep. Can they interbreed? Yep. Well, then how do you know it's a different, it's the same kind? I think the biblical definition kind would be if they can breed, they're the same kind. So I don't think this word species is any special magic word, but, and I'm very familiar with, you know, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and how their things are classified. Again, the animals don't care how we classify them at all. They look for their own kind. 
The dogs can look for polar, fever. Can a polar bear and a grizzly bear produce offspring? They can indeed. It's called a pizzly. Really? I had no idea. All yeah. right, please continue. The eight different varieties of bears have been crossbred, most of them, and I covered that on my video number four of my seminar mm -hmm. series. But yes, they're still bear. Now, can a polar bear and a pine tree breed? Now, wait, hold on, hold on. Bear is a species, right? And species can interbreed, right? What you have with bears, I believe the term would then be like a, actually, you know what? I don't know if race is a biological term. I'm going to pause well, myself on that. But I'm pretty sometimes. sure that race is a biological term used to describe um, a specific different groupings of a species. And within that species group, you have different races and those races can interbreed with um, higher and lower percent chances based on how closely they're related, how similar their environments are. And eventually those variations build up so much that they're no longer able to interbreed. And that's when you get a new species. Right, but again, a, so, chihuahua, and so. a, a chihuahua and a Great Dane, probably they could theoretically interbreed. Biologically, they can. It's gonna kill mm -hmm. the mama if that's a chihuahua. But sure, there are limits to how big you can get, but they're obviously still a dog. And again, they know what the same kind is. The male dogs seek out the female dogs and even coyotes and wolves can interbreed. So you get a coy wolf, a coy dog, There's, all this has been done. So, but th this is not the point. Your chart here shows not only all the dogs, they think the dogs are related to frogs. Do you think you're related to a frog? As I've said repeatedly, if you go back in time and continue to examine the material conditions through the traces of those conditions that we can find, then yes, eventually, if you go back far enough, you're going to find a common ancestor. None of that disproves it. Because again, yeah. you're still using biblical terms. It doesn't matter if the animals agree with it or disagree with it. What matters is, that, is how we are categorizing the processes that are happening. You can't just on the fly change the definitions of things. Like if, if we're gonna do that, then I might as well say that I worship Superman. And Superman is obviously a God because he ran fast enough to turn back time. It's, it's just weird. Like, what are we getting at here? Let's keep consistent yeah. terminology. We're gonna use, since the debate is over whether or not there's enough evidence to disprove evolution, then what we need to be doing is sticking to terms that the theory uses. If you're using other terms, then nothing's going to make sense. You just work uh, back. That's why I said at the beginning, we have to define what we mean by this word evolution. And I point out in my seminars thousands of times, but there are really your definition right there, variations within kinds, you're using a biblical term. It doesn't work if you're using terms from outside the field. I can't talk about water pressure and electricity in the same sentence. I can't say that water pressure is electricity. If I try to make that claim, it's ridiculous. That's what that's what you're doing right there by including biblical terms, things that exist outside of the theory. You try to force them in. You can't put a square peg into a round hole. It doesn't work. Evan, that's what you're doing. Evan. Evan, you will find if you do research on this, you have the very same problem with the word species. A dog and a wolf are different species, but they can interbreed. So exactly what does the word species mean, Evan? Uh, if I remember correctly from my biology book, a species is a group of animals who are capable of breeding together and have similar enough characteristics. Okay, so, then if, if if they're capable of breeding, why did they put the dog and the wolf in different species? Because they can still interbreed. Are they different species or are they different races? That's an important distinction to yeah. make. Your mic is Evan, breaking up. Evan, your, your mic just suddenly started becoming staticky. I'm not sure if you did something on your end in that moment over the computer. Um, Maybe let's do a, an audio test now and see if it's improved. We just have about two minutes left in the discussion portion. Anyways, gentlemen, if you guys wanted to start winding it down with final points, anything else you'd like to get out? Evan, why don't we uh, give you an audio test right now and see if it's improved? Uh, how's it sound? Uh, it's still coming in kind of – it is staticking. Um, it just happened, though. Let me see. If I adjust your mic and okay, try it now. Hello, hello, hello. 
seems to have improved. I guess we can try from here. We just have um, a couple more minutes anyways, Evan. So if there's a, a final point you wanted to make, final question um, for Kent as we start to wind down and move towards closing statements, go ahead. Um, I don't really have anything. I just wanted to thank you, Kent, for having this conversation with me. I had a lot of fun. I hope you did too. Uh, I look forward to any future conversations we have. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. Well, we do have closing statements. So let's do this, uh, gentlemen, since it was about a 45 minute back and forth discussion, lots of excellent points discussed throughout. Let's have a five minute concluding statement. And this way we can we can kind of wrap up our thoughts, wrap up our points. I'll organize the uh, audience questions that have come in and uh, therefore we'll have some time for some some good audience Q&A. So with that, Evan, you did start. So we'll give you the first five minutes in terms of closing statements, and then we'll give Kent the same. So Evan, whenever you're ready. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know if I need five minutes. Uh, the only thing I really need to say is that, um, you know, this is a really hard topic to talk about. And um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in the discussion, like um, disagreeing on terminology, which you guys saw us, uh, Kent and I have at the end there. Um, I think maybe in the future, I'll work hard to define those terms so that we're all speaking on the same, same playing field, because otherwise, you know, if we're not using like terms then nothing's going to make sense, you're going to make points that seem to on the surface disprove something, but because you're not using the right stuff, it, it doesn't. Um, yeah, I had a great time. Kent, I hope you did as well. That's all I really have to say. Thank you so much for y'all's time. Evan, I appreciate the closing statement. I'm sure we will be um, getting a round two in there at some point in 2023. So definitely an enjoyable and engaging discussion. Kent, we're now going to hand it to you. And you have up to five minutes as well for a closing statement. Whenever you're ready, Kent, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. And I appreciate you doing this, Evan. And you're invited to Dinosaur Adventureland anytime. We can have a debate right here. I'll just show you around, give you a tour. We, I love science. Love science. Taught it 15 years. And I think science should include things we can observe, study, and test. This is not science. This is a family tree. This is a religious belief. Not science at all. Science would tell us there are 39 breeds of dogs that they've now recognized by the American Kennel Association. And they had a common ancestor called a dog. That family tree I might go along with. I think we could trace back, you know, how they developed the Chihuahua. Now, why they did it, I don't know, but they did it, okay? The Bible says they will bring forth after their kind, after their kind, after his kind, after his kind, after his kind. I mean, it's in there a bunch of times after their sort, uh, 24 times altogether in the first seven chapters. So the Bible clearly teaches they're going to bring forth after their kind. So if they can bring forth, they're the same kind. Dogs, wolves, and coyotes can bring forth live offspring. Uh, the... Eight different kinds of bears can bring forth babies called a bear. But that doesn't prove the bears are related to pine trees. There are 115 varieties of pine trees recognized by scientists. Could have come from a common ancestor called a pine tree. I wouldn't argue with that. But that does not prove pine trees are related to frogs. This is where they, say, they show the science of pine trees producing a variety. Look at this one. More longer needles, shorter needles, bigger pine cones, smaller pine cone. Yeah. And then jump to the wild conclusion that pine trees are related to mosquitoes. This is not only not science, it's just plain dumb. There's no kind way to say it. It's dumb to believe pine trees and mosquitoes are related. We get varieties of dogs, but they're still a dog. Big dog, little dog. Any four-year-old will tell you a dog, wolf, and coyote are the same, but the banana is not. Okay, And bring forth after their kind. That's what we observe. Now, Darwin talked about the origin of species, and there are at least uh, 14 different definitions or 21 different definitions of the word species. Uh, evolution, the self-licking uh, ice cream cone. He's a lion coyote. A coyote can mate with a dog. They get coy, uh, coyote Australian shepherd mix. Wow, look at that. Wolves in the eastern United States can mate with coyotes. Ah, look at that. They can do it. Science.org. The koi wolf. Hmm, they can crossbreed. Canid hybrid of a koi dog, coyote and dog, okay? So they're still the same kind. There are three species and close to 40 subspecies of wolf, all the wolves of the world. They might have had a common ancestor. There's one from Central and Southeast Asia. Look at that, still in the dog kind. So but what happens 
people look at these variations of the dog kind, they're still the same family. And again, these, this, def, this division that we have made, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, the dogs don't care how we classify them. They don't even know how we classify them. They don't talk about it at all. Man has decided to make these definitions, and they're just plain baloney. Here's 19 definitions of subspe different subspecies of coyote. Hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> I think real science would tell us what we observe is dogs produce dogs. If you wish to believe, that's evidence that dogs came from an amoeba. That's a religion. And I wish you guys would just admit you have a religious belief. A wolf, coyote, and jackal all have 78 chromosomes. They hybridize freely. Okay. Dog, wolf, coyote, jackal, fox, probably had a common ancestor, but that doesn't give justification for claiming they're related to pine trees and frogs. So what you guys have is a religious belief that pine trees and sunflowers and dogs are related. That's not science. All these creatures have 34 chromosomes. What does that mean? Nothing. That's the way they're designed. I think they're designed. Uh, so my, my statement would be, closing statement in one last minute, what we've observed is exactly what God said would happen. They would bring forth after their kind. That's all we've seen. And that's what, you know, there seems to be a limit to this. The evolutionist believes by faith in their religion that if you gave it enough time, the amoeba would turn to a dog. Well, you can believe that all you want, but stop calling it science. Stop teaching it to the kids in public school. Why don't all you guys who believe that dumb idea go start a private school and teach evolution to kids that want to pay and come learn it? Why are you making everybody pay for your religion to be taught? That's exactly what's happening. We have a state-funded religion by teaching evolution in schools. That's all we have. There's the smallest dog in the world, completely useless. So they're still dog. And thank you so much for doing this. There seems to be a limit to dog size. Okay? Okay, Ken, thank you so much for that five-minute closing statement. Evan and Ken, thank you for an engaging debate, a cordial debate. I really appreciated the organic back and forth. So with that, we're going to move into some audience Q&A time. I will remind everybody we will be back here in, I believe it's in two days, the 29th, for the next debate on evolution, specifically uh, Kent and Grayson. And then also first thing in January, kicking off the year the right way, we're going to have a year in review show, me and Dr. Dino, and we will open up the mic for this. So anybody uh, of the evolution persuasion, you could say that, that wants to join and bring an argument or a question, um, feel free to do so. I'm looking forward to this show. So with that, okay, Evan, this is your first time here on the uh, program. So what we typically do with the audience Q&A is whoever the question is for, we just make sure they get the last word, but that way we can have you both respond and then we can move along smoothly. So let's, I guess, start at the beginning and we've got... Dr. Dino, your number one fan, creationist crybaby, and <laughs> CC. One of these days, we're going to get CC here in the uh, in the ring for an evolution debate. So, <laughs> CC is asking Kent, can you please explain how post-flood kinds speciated so rapidly, considering their common arc origin? Sure. I think uh, I had a family uh, give, come to my seminar one time and they said, you know, we've been in the dog kennel business, breeding dogs for a hundred years. Our family has. Grandpa started it, then dad took over and now this guy got it. They said, this, this person said to me, I can tell you right now, you could give us 10 or 15 generic mutts, pick any mutts you want. Let us have them for 100 years. We can recreate Great Dane, Chihuahua and everything in between in 100 years. I think natural selection works great. The dog's getting off the ark. Some liked the colder climate. They had thicker fur. They were able to survive better there. So pretty soon you got a species of thicker furred dogs. Some preferred the hotter climate. The natural selection would be, play a part. Artificial selection where man gets involved plays another part. Most of the cow varieties have been produced by artificial selection. Some farmer decided, I want more milk. I want more beef. I want, you know, more heat resistance or whatever. So both, both work but they're both selecting a trait that already exists. 
The dairy farmers have selected cows that give more milk. They didn't create the udder on the cow. The cow already had the udder. Why don't you get fish that give milk? Okay. So the, the, all that we've seen, I think within a few hundred years, getting off the ark, there's not a problem. Animals spreading out to different parts of the world. Some would survive in the colder climate, some wouldn't. And so they would kind of automatically adjust to where they want to go, like humans. I prefer the south to the north. It's cold up there. You guys keep it. Okay, thank you, Ken, for that response. Evan, over to you if you had a response as well. Go ahead. Um, you know, I think that's a great question from, uh, I think you called him CC. I think that username is hilarious, by the way. Um, you know, it, it's interesting that even in Ken's response, he's acknowledging that natural selection, a key component of the theory of evolution, is something that is used throughout everything, every part of our lives to explain the answer that he has to CC. That's really all I got. I mean, if you, if you want to, if you want to ignore the time constraint, if you want to ignore uh, the different material conditions that bring about different species, if you want to pretend that um, a species can't become a different species over a long period of time under vastly different material conditions, then I, I can't help you. It's just what it is. Okay, thank you, Evan. Kent, question was for you. You can have the last word, go ahead. Okay, I don't think Evan or CC understand or will acknowledge Natural selection works, but there are limits. And it's only selecting, it's not creating anything. In their mind, they think, wow, it can create things. No, it doesn't create anything. They naturally, they artificially selected dogs till they got down to my wife's dumb dog, the pug. Okay? Sorry, master, skin also wrinkled. Skin for two dogs on one body. I can no fix. Maybe chase park car, smashed face in. So. I think that we've, you want to see what they've done with dogs. They've created completely useless ones now. But they're never going to get a mosquito or anything other than a dog out of this. There's just simply no evidence. I think the post-flood in 4,400 years, all the nature or artificial man would select varieties within the same kind. We have 339 breeds of dogs. They're still dog. That's all they're ever going to get. I, I bet you five bucks on that. Go ahead. Okay, Kent, thank you so much for that final word. Next question comes in from Boomer21. Boomer, thanks so much for the support and super chat and question for Evan. So Boomer's asking, if the Bible isn't true, then how do you explain the discoveries of the top of Mount Sinai, the Red Sea crossing, and Sodom and Gomorrah, just to name a few? Evan, go ahead. Um, I'm not particularly sure. Uh, what you're alluding to with those things. I assume that there's some um, cultural artifacts that were found in those areas. If so, you know, I never said, I've actually never made a claim in this debate about the Bible being true or false. Maybe maybe the Bible can exist in cohabitation with theories of evolution and science. It doesn't have to be antagonistic towards it. I mean, that's really my only position there. But you know, the, as far as I'm aware, the Bible is just a collection of stories of people over time. And sometimes those stories are going to lead to certain things, like maybe cultural artifacts. And that's all I can say about those things, you know. Thank you, Evan. And uh, Kat, over to you if you had a response. Yes, sir. I take the Bible to be much more than that. I think the God who created this world decided to, and maybe is even obligated to, create a record of how we did it and why and what the rules are. If I create, uh, if you create a city, you might want to pass some laws. Here's the speed limit on this street because you, you made the city. It's yours. You can make whatever laws you want. God made this world. He gave us the rules in his book. Some people don't like his rules, so they deny his existence. That won't bode well judgment day. You can live your life that way for now and pretend he doesn't exist if you'd like. I think there have been thousands of discoveries of things the Bible talked about. For instance, the Bible talks about all the animals and plants bringing forth after their kind. Nobody's seen an exception to that, except want to argue about the definition of kind. Can they bring forth? They did. Okay. So I think what we've observed is that the Bible is what has been proven of the Bible. There's nothing in the Bible been proven wrong. How's that? Not all of it's been proven right, but it, nothing's been proven wrong. 
There's 31,101 verses in there. Lots of them have been proven right. One atheist said he didn't believe the Bible. He said, if you could prove one verse out of the Bible, I'll believe it. So his friend grabbed him by the nose and started twisting it back and forth until he started bleeding. He said, what are you doing? Showed him the Bible verse, the ringing of the nose, bringeth forth blood. There you go. Proved it to you. So <laughs> I don't recommend that. But uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm aware of the people who did these discoveries, Mount Sinai, Red Sea Crossing. Uh, I, I think it's absolutely true. I cover that in my video number seven of my series. Okay. Thank you, Kent, for the response. Uh, Evan, question was for you this time. You get the last word. Um, yeah, I just want to reiterate that I haven't specified my position on the Bible. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know what to say to you about the uh, things that you find in these areas. Like I said, it's, it's a collection of stories. You know, you're going to find evidence of people passing through areas. Which is what it is. Okay. Thank you Okay, thank you, uh, Evan. Next question comes in from Lyle. This one is for Kent. And Lyle is asking, Kent, do you agree with the fact of science that a human cell has the same features as a chimpanzee cell, which has the same features as a single-celled eukaryote? Well, that's a gross oversimplification. A uh, eukaryote simply means the nucleus in the cell is bound in a membrane. Some are prokaryotes, some are eukaryotes. Again, that doesn't prove any common ancestry. Some cars have engines in the front, some have engines in the back, some have engines in the middle. What does that prove? A relationship? No, it's a design feature. I think the guy who designed the chimpanzee also designed the human, and we have some similarities because they have the same designer. That's all. All the books in my library, and I have thousands of them here, all of them use the same 26 letters of the alphabet. Wow. Does that mean they're related? No, that's the code, English alphabet. The DNA code found in all the different creatures is the code. See, if we didn't have similarities between all the other plants and animals, we could only eat each other. But now the brown cow can eat the green grass and give the white milk and churn it and make the yellow butter, and I eat it and get the blonde hair. That's, that's, that's a great design in nature. But the evolutionist looks at these similarities and says, ah, we're related. I look at them and say, no, we have a common designer. So the fight will go on, I'm sure. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Kent. Evan, if there's anything you'd like to add, go uh, I think that's a, a fantastic observation. Thank you for pointing that out. I would never thought of that. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you. <laughs> that's all I got. Okay, Evan, thank you so much. Kent, if there's anything uh, you wanted to add in terms of last words, go ahead. Yeah, it sounds like maybe we'll get Evan converted one day. Sounds great. Keep going. Okay, thank you. And um, all right, next question comes in from, let's see here. We've got a question from David McQuain. Uh, thank you so much for the support, the super chat, and the questions for you, Evan. So David is asking for Evan, seeing as how the evolutionary theory heavily relies on beneficial mutations being the driving factor. Can you name a beneficial mutation that we have observed, studied, tested, or demonstrated? Go ahead, Evan. I actually can. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put this in the private chat. Uh, Donnie, if you wouldn't mind putting that into the live chat so people can oh, hold on one second here to get this link. Okay, there we go. So in this link, there's a study which talks about how since 1954, Kyoto University has been managing a population of fruit flies living in total darkness. Uh, they've been breeding those flies for over 1,500 generations, and they found 84 genes that uh, make no significant visual differences. There are differences in the lengths of the hairs on their body, which makes it um, easier for them to detect their environment. So that that is is a beneficial mutation that we have observed, studied, tested, and demonstrated. Okay, thank you, Evan. Um, your response there was kind of staticky, so I, I would say some of it came through and, and some of it might have been lost in, in the static, but that's um, that's fine, Evan. It seems like throughout the debate, it eventually improves. It's, it's kind of an intermittent thing. Um, so, Kent, if there's anything you'd like to add, though, go ahead. Well, what they observed with the fruit flies, and I thought I had slides for that. My hyperlink is broken. I covered that on video number four. After extensive testing on fruit flies, 
they raise thousands of generations since you get a short generation time with flies. One group of scientists could watch actually certainly hundreds, maybe even thousands of generations. They did all kinds of things to those flies, nuked them, microwaved them, x-rayed them. They produced a lot of varieties of flies. They had flies with four wings. They can't fly. Flies with no wings. They can't fly either. They're not a fly. Now they're a crawl. They had flies with antenna where their eyes used to be. They never got an improvement on the fly. All they got was a bunch of mutated flies. I would have to differ and say, I'm sorry, nobody's ever seen what anybody would consider a beneficial mutation. It might be beneficial for the guy, you know, might develop a fly with no wings and now he can't fly and bother your fruit crop. Well, it's not beneficial for the fly. So I, I would differ and say, I don't think anybody's ever seen one. If there were one, you'd have to have trillions of, of, of quadrillions of beneficial mutations to turn an amoeba to a whale or a human, okay? And nobody's ever seen proven one. But if you had one beneficial mutation, let's say there is one, who's it gonna marry? You gotta get two of the opposite sex in the same place at the same time. And then those two have to somehow mate and produce babies that can take over the whole population of the world. I think it's gonna be swamped uh, more likely than, than to take over. So that's why I say evolution is a religion of death. This is really Adolf Hitler 101. Let's get the superior species and eliminate all the rest of them and speed up the process. If you had a beneficial mutation, the rest of them have to die, don't they? All right, appreciate the response there, Kent and Evan. The question was for you, so you can have a quick final word. Go ahead. I don't have anything else for uh, David McQueen. I, I do just have like one thing for you, Kent. Why did you just connect evolution? Um, am I cutting out? Yeah, you just have that, that static going on. I, I wonder if you would refresh your mic, if that would help. If you go into the settings, go yeah, under right. the audio box and then uh, maybe put it to the webcam and then put it back to the external mic. Refreshing, it might help. How's that? Any better? Hello, it, it hello. sounded good there. It, it sounded good there, so that might have... That might have improved it. So <laughs> if you wanted to ask okay. uh, Kent your question, we'll try and get it out again. Go ahead. All right. So uh, I apologize, uh, David. Uh, I don't have anything else for you to say. Thank you for your question. Um, Ken, I just have a question for you. Like, why did you make this connection to Hitler there? Like, what, what type of emotional response are you trying to evoke from the people listening? Oh. I, I just don't understand why you did that. Well, it's not an emotional because, response. Like, it's a it's a fact of history. Hitler was a strong believer in evolution. He thought he was speeding up the process. I simply point out in my seminar, evolution is not only a dumb religion, it's dangerous. Okay, so, Donna, I apologize. This might turn into a, a bit of a harsh back and forth here. Go for it. Ken, <laughs> evolution didn't, like, seed the ground for Hitler. You know, he, he would have used any means by which he could to justify the atrocities that he occurred. You making that connection, you're trying to associate this theory with horrible, horrible things. Don't do that, man. Because like, if we're going to go down that route, then I'm just going to start talking about like religious institutions massacring minorities. It's not productive. It doesn't take us anywhere. We don't get anywhere closer to like a fundamental truth. All it does is provoke emotional responses. Let's be honest in the conversation we're having. That's not cool, man. And, oh, you mean, know, like, the only other thing I have to add on to that is that, like, yeah, Hitler did use evolution for that. But the reason why he used it is because at the time they were operating under certain cultural ideas about hierarchy, ideas that we still in the United States operate under and uh, with some of our policies towards minorities and our communities. It's, it had nothing to do with the theory. The theory was just the justification. You can't look at one thing and use it to explain away all of the sum total of the events that led to the thing. Well, Donnie, let's have, another, let's have another whole debate sometime on the dangers of evolution. This sure, theory I would love to. You know, can we actually do a tag team on that since I'm more STEM focused? Sure. Okay. Cool. But the topic, the topic for tonight is, is there enough evidence to discredit evolution? There is no evidence that it's ever happened. 
I found my fruit fly stuff after raising 40 million years worth of evolution for the fruit flies. They discovered fruit flies produce fruit flies. They got flies with curly wings, no wings at all, stubby wings. Fruit flies refuse to become anything but fruit flies. So science would tell us all mutations that they observed made flies that were inferior. So that's a good observation. But their conclusion was fruit flies must have evolved as far as they can go. That's a bad conclusion. They didn't evolve at all. There's no evidence at all. Darwin as fit as ever. Flies in the north are 4% bigger wings than flies in the south. Well, they got to stand cold weather up there. It's got nothing to do with that. So my, my observation, would, my, my scientific observation is fruit flies have always produced fruit fly babies. No, no difference. None. There's the, the, the variations are limited. They're still fly. They got flies that couldn't fly at all. That's not, there, there's no science for your theory. I'm sorry, Evan. You believe, capital B, believe in evolution. You're welcome to it. But quit calling it science. It's not science. Those family trees are pure religious. Nothing else. Evan, if you wanted a quick final word, since the question is for you, then we'll move on to the next. No, I'm good. Thank you for the question, David. Okay. Angelo La Gruta has a question here. Thanks so much, Angelo, for the support. Super chat and question for Evan. So Angelo says, you admitted life didn't exist on Earth. And then it did. If that's the case, why is Earth the only planet that has life on it? You see, that is a fantastic question. But in it, you have a baked in assumption, which is that there is no life on other planets. We haven't yet observed it. So your question with the claim in it, it doesn't, it doesn't really fit. Until we can observe that no planet has life on it, then, you know, my hands are tied. If you find a planet that has life on it, then we're going to have to start asking really big questions about our position as a species, our position as a planet, as a where we are in space even. I mean, that, that is a, a fascinating observation that, that takes you down so many rabbit holes if you really go into it. So thank you for asking it, Angela. Evan, thank you. The first three quarters of the answer was a bit staticky. And then I think your mic got oh. hit with a beneficial mutation and, and it improved. So there's evidence for evolution right there. Uh, Ket, over to you if you had a response. <laughs> well, I agree. The evolutionist, uh, I think, should readily admit they do have a serious problem going from non-life to life. The simplest life form we know of is more complex than the space shuttle. To think it happened by chance is idiotic. If you wish to believe that, that's fine, but don't call it science. Going from life from non-living material to the first any any life form is a leap from here to Jupiter. It, it doesn't happen. It's not science. So, the, and as far as we know, science is what we can observe and study and test. The only place life exists is here on this planet. No, there's no known life anywhere else. You can imagine all you want and you get your Star Trek imagination going, but that's not science. It's science is what we can observe. We know life is here. We've never seen it anywhere else. It's almost like maybe it was designed for here. Almost. Go ahead. Thank you, Kent. Evan, question was for you. You can have a quick final word. Um, yeah, you know, it is a really good question about, you know, like if we go from this chemical pool that would have been quote unquote primordial earth for lack of a better phrasing and terminology it is a question of how we got from that primordial soup into single cell multi-cell multi-system beings but that's a question for biologists and i think they have really good answers if you're interested feel free to come on our show sometime uh never game over we stream wednesdays and fridays from 7 to 9 p.m eastern standard time ask your questions in the chat and maybe we can direct you to some uh materials be it interviews or books Okay, thank you, Evan. Next question comes in from Taylor K. Appreciate the question. And Taylor just put out a video yesterday sometime that featured some clips from uh, the evolution debates over the course of the last year. And so I appreciate that. And Taylor's got a question specifically, though, for Evan and Kent. Yes, that's, that's the video right there. So definitely, people, go check it out. And Evan, 
she is asking you, did innate or how did innate abilities like the spider building a web, a bird building a nest, or a beaver building a dam evolve? You know, I'll, I'll add on to that question. We'll make it even more complicated. How did humans get the innate ability to look at things happening in our environment and decide to create cool systems that help us in those environments? I don't know. I would say that evolution has set forth certain conditions that uh, create a necessity for intelligence and the ability to create those systems. Those are favorable um, adaptations and mutations to our hours and the like all species um, code. That's that's the only thing I can provide you. Okay, I appreciate the response there, Evan and Kent. Over to you. Well, and thank you, Taylor. You look the same age as my daughter. She's 11. Come on down to Dinosaur Adventure Land. You two will have a blast. We'll put you on the channel here. I really enjoyed your questions. I didn't know if Taylor was a boy or girl or man or woman. I got the video. I said, thank you for sending that to me. So I think creatures that have this ability to do things that are stunning, like beavers building a dam, that's incredible. Nobody, they don't go to school for one minute. Birds building a nest. Who taught them that? Uh, all the creatures seem to have the innate ability, like almost like it was designed. I think it was designed. So I think, let's say you asked about a spider building a web. Some of the spider webs are beyond imagination. How complex they are. How can the spider run on the web and not get stuck to it, but the bug gets stuck to it? It's pretty cool. See, for millions of years, it didn't work. They all got stuck to their own web and they all died. None of them survived for millions of years until they finally figured it out. I think the whole evolution is, idea is so dumb, beyond, beyond, there's no kind words for it. So thank you. Uh, come on down, uh, Taylor, and visit Dinosaur Adventureland, play with my daughter, and uh, we'll put you on our channel here. Have a good time. Thank you. Okay, appreciate it. Taylor says she'll be there, Kent. So sounds fine. Okay. Come on. And Evan, question was for you. You can have the final word. Go ahead. Taylor, that was a fantastic question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, I hope to see you on stream sometime. I'd love for you to ask us those kinds of questions because they're they're fascinating and they're cool to think about. So thank you for your interest. And I hope you continue to curate that curiosity about the world around you because it's going to take you to some really cool places. All right, thank you, Evan. And this one, as we start to wind down here with a couple more questions, let's say, <laughs> to the audience, I've got a lot of people that are saying, um, <laughs> A lot of people that are saying, actually, no, I haven't looked at this question before. So let's see. For Kent, do you think you would be closer to deism or atheism if you, well, maybe the, the second half of the question, I don't know what, what he's asking. Is this the Kennedy from uh, last week's debate? I don't know how you want to respond, Kent. <laughs> well, uh, I would not call Kennedy a hottie to begin with. Okay, so let's eliminate that. Uh, that's not my idea of hot. Let's see. Do uh, you think it would be closer to deism or atheism if you somehow, if you somehow accepted the premises? Well, accepted is a strong word. I think believed. If I believed like Evan believed, I would probably go shoot myself because I think I'd be embarrassed for believing something so dumb. Uh, so I, I believe there's overwhelming evidence there has to be a designer. If you're walking through the woods and you find an arrowhead, mixed all the gravel would you conclude it happened by chance or somebody designed it somebody took a rock and chipped it and designed it into a certain shape an arrowhead nobody with one functioning brain cell would think the arrowhead made itself or is a natural product from erosion or exfoliation or thermal expansion it was designed just an arrowhead and yet you look at a human cell and think nobody designed it i don't understand how anybody can believe such a thing. So I think I would object to some of the words in your in your question. Uh, I don't think you accept evolution. You believe in evolution. There's no accepting it. Science, what we can observe, study, and test. I accept the fact that cows produce cows and dogs produce dogs. I accept that. That's what we have observed. That's what everybody's observed in the whole world. Nobody's ever reported anything other than that. So you want me to believe cows and dogs are related? Nah, I don't want to believe that. That would be a belief, not a science. So as far as Hati, no thanks. Go ahead. 
<laughs> Thank you, Kent. Evan, anything you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, first off, Kent, ouch, that hurt. My goodness, no need to go that far. No need to call me dumb. Come on, man. No, no, uh, I said the belief, not, hmm? the belief is dumb. Oh, okay. Thank you for uh, amending that. Um, if I were to uh, answer that question for myself, I'm probably closer to atheist than deist. I personally, you know, when I think about the scope of the universe and all the things that we don't have answers for, I, I, I don't know. I find it kind of hard to think that maybe there's not something out there. But I also don't have any evidence for it being there. So until that's, you know, definitively proven, then I'm going to continue to be suspicious of it. And I think that's something we should all strive to be is suspicious of things. So, you know, everybody keep asking great questions. I'm thinking. And okay, also, Kenny, you. you are a hottie. Go you, baby. Okay, thank you, Evan. Kent, did you want a quick final word? And then we're going to move on to, it looks like, one last question. Then we're going to wrap it up. Time flies by here. Yeah, I was wondering about the wrap it up because I've been drinking water for two hours. It's cold here, and I got a hottie waiting for me. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one more question. Just because there's snow on the roof don't mean there ain't a fire in the furnace. Okay, let's see. Well, that question's for Evan. Go ahead. Okay, here we go. Final question. And uh, I got to say to the audience, there's so many people saying, what about my question? What about my question? We've got a ton of questions that came in. We could never get to all of them or else we'd be here for 10 hours. So here's the last question. It comes in from whether or not $5 super chat. Kent, Evan, thanks for making this fun. We'll make this a quick final question. So Evan, whether or not it's asking you, do an experiment using extreme artificial selection in as much time as you want, make yeast grow a functioning flagellum tail? Question mark. Go ahead. I love the idea of that experiment. Unfortunately, I suspect it would take so much time that I would no longer be around to see its effects. But you know what? I bet somewhere there are people who are trying to do that very same experiment. Earlier, I provided a link to a study that was testing uh, fruit flies and seeing what happens if you change their material conditions such that light isn't available. And that study has found that, you know, there are changes. And over time, those changes are going to become more and more extreme until eventually it's no longer a fruit fly. It's some other type of insect. And that's cool to think about. So thank you for your question. Okay, thank you, Evan. Kent, is there anything you wanted to add, or should we? You know, you wanted to go to the restroom, and I know how that feels. So, it's up to you, brother. Yeah. What What Evan just gave is a classic example of this is what he believes, and time is his god. If we had enough time, maybe it could happen. Okay. First of all, we don't have enough time. Secondly, it's not observed to happen. It's a religious belief. You can believe in anything you want, but it's not science. Okay. So you're never going to get a uh, uh, yeast to grow a functioning tail. Uh, the, it, you can try if you like, but if a bunch of scientists could make it happen, that wouldn't prove it happened in nature. That would only prove it takes intelligence to make these changes. I bet intelligent people could put a V8 engine on a motorcycle if they worked at it. Might not be too smart, but somebody could do it. Okay, what does that prove? That doesn't prove it happens in, in the wild on its own. So I think I stand my ground. Evolution's a religion. The topic of the debate tonight, is there enough evidence to discredit evolution? I say... I won. Thank you for trying. Try again, Evan. Okay. Thank you, Kent. This is the final question. It was for you, Evan. So if you want, you can have the final word. I think it's your sister in the chat. Uh, she said it was enjoyable watching uh, watching her brother debate tonight. So go ahead. Final word. Uh, thank you, Jesse, so much. I'm so glad you were watching. I love you so much. Um, the only thing I have to say, you know, Kent, I noticed that the main difference between you and I is that I'm willing to accept that there is a certain amount of guesswork involved in the things that we do. And that's, you know, I talked about it in my intro, you know, that's how the scientific process works. We aren't sure. Over time, our ideas become more and more complex and they become harder and harder to disprove. So I'm just, I'm curious, you know, why are you so opposed to allowing for this, this option or this, thing to possibly exist you're like I, i'm willing to admit that i don't know if a god exists so why why are you so positive that evolution is wrong why are you not willing to give these ideas the same level of respect that i'm giving yours okay thank you evan oh i'm sorry ken let me just unmute you okay go ahead bro. evan are you saying you're willing to give my 
position, the same level of respect? Do you think there could have been a designer that wrote a book and made everything 6,000 years ago? Would you give that idea some respect? I would give it respect so long as there was evidence to prove it. And if it, you know, if it did disprove the theory of evolution and the way we understand time, then I would have no, no option but to accept it because that would then be the new scientific theory that we would then have to disprove. And until we got to that point where we disproved it, then that would be the working theory. And unfortunately, you know, there was a point in time, sorry, not unfortunately, that was a misspeak. There was a point in time where creationism was the predominant worldview. As a matter of fact, most people in the United States, I apologize to anybody who's listening overseas, uh, it is the predominant belief among the population. It doesn't necessarily, like the amount of people who believe something doesn't make it more or less true. You know what I mean? So we have to, we have to ask questions that, that push our understanding. So we can't, we can't root our feet in the sand and just decide that we're not going to budge anymore. You know, that's, you're limiting your own potential there. And I think that's sad. I think we should all strive to curate the same curiosity that Taylor presented earlier with that phenomenal question. Okay, Evan, thank you. Kent, final words, final thoughts before we close it down? Well, sure. I think in communist countries, you'll find the majority believe in communism because if they don't, you know, they can't get a job or get killed or whatever. In Muslim countries, you, the most majority claim they believe in Islam. In Hindu countries, the majority they claim they believe in one of their gods. So in a country where evolution is the dominant religion, if you dare to question that, you may not get a job. They certainly won't let you teach in a public school. It's got nothing to do with the truth of the subject. It's a, it's a political thing. And evolution is tied in deeply with politics. It's got nothing to do with science. It's a religious belief. You're welcome to it. But it's not science. You didn't give any evidence today other than over millions of years it could have happened. That's not science. That's a belief. Thank you for demonstrating clearly evolution's a religion. That's all you did tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kat. Thank you, Evan. Appreciate both of your time for tonight. We look forward to probably a, a round two in the future. So we're going to let you both get out of here. Kent, Evan, again, thanks for a memorable debate to the audience. Thank you for tuning in. I'll be back in just about 10 seconds for some reminders and announcements. God bless all. And Evan and Kent again, thanks so much. Okay, there we go. Another one in the books, specifically in the Evolution Debate Challenge series. Uh, this was the second last debate, actually, this year for the uh, 2022 Evolution Debate Challenge series that will continue into uh, 2023. And so I look forward to hopefully topping this year, although topping 50, 50 debates on just basically evolution this year was a ton of fun. It's It's been a wild ride. I would say it's been a pretty prolific series. Evan and Kent tonight made for an excellent debate. Very easy to moderate. I appreciate them keeping it civil. So the last debate will be on the 29th. Last debate is in the last debate of the year on evolution before we move into 2023 where we've already got a, a, a ton of events set for you guys. So uh, the 29th will be Grayson versus Kent round two, evolution on trial. Grayson is in the chat currently. Looks like there's going to be an after show over on Grayson's channel. So if you want to check that out, I think he's going to be doing more and more after shows uh, moving into 2023. Just so there's several different channels that are hosting after shows. Grayson, John Maddox from the Logical, Plausible, Probable channel as well. And so that'll be Thursday. Let me say this before I forget. So with these debates, especially the evolution debates, when we get close to 300 people, every single debate. I get a ton of questions that come in. So for this one specifically, 
I've got uh, 27 questions to be exact uh, saved. So there's no way we can ever get through them all. Of course, I want to honor the super chats that come in that have questions attached to them. So several super chats came in with, with comments and just people showing some love. And so thank you so much for that. Not specific questions. But if they are uh, super chats with questions, I want to honor those, of course. So typically I, I make sure that we get those in there. If I do miss one of those, I make sure that whoever sent the super chat gets uh, first dibs, you could say, during our next debate. So I believe we on Stand for Truth host the most debates on evolution. So if you don't get your question answered, let's say during a specific debate, we'll make sure that, that you get your question uh, answered whether it's the same one or a different one for um, for the next debate. And so apologies ahead of time if we can't get to all 27 questions. We probably would have a three-hour Q&A. Typically, we have about 30 minutes for Q&A. So uh, just wanted to make sure people were aware of that. And so, okay, I wanted to also remind everybody that... Kent and I will be here. This is, let me double check. I believe it's the fifth. If you guys go to the event section of the channel, upcoming live streams, we just hit 12.1 thousand subscribers. So thank you for that. Um, 2023, you know, we look forward to hitting 15,000 and 20,000. So guys, standing for truth, we're just getting started. So share this content around, share it around to your friends and family. I'm a debate addict. I think critical thinking is incredibly important, which is why we host so many of these debates on different topics. And so if you've never done a debate, but you're interested in jumping into the debate octagon, shoot me an email. My main email now that I'm working towards using primarily in 2023 is standingfortruthministries at gmail.com. So several emails have come in, people that want to uh, debate evolution with Kent for uh, 2023. So I'm working on setting those. Anybody else who wants to participate in any debate on any topic, just let me know what, what your biggest interests are, and I'll do my best to set you up with, with an interlocutor. Uh, Iron Matt, thank you so much, brother, for the uh, super sticker there. I appreciate everybody's support. You guys are the life and blood of this channel. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, this is a good point. It, it, and for those that like to set, send in questions, we've, um, we're a debate platform as well. So if you want to ask a question specifically in, in a debate or even a discussion. So I think what this is going to be good for the evolution debate challenge year in re review with, with Kent and myself. So this will be on January 5th. So for all of, um, those of, let's say, the evolution position, those that have wanted to engage in a debate this year, but maybe for whatever reason, they didn't want to do a, the formal debates that we do. And so, but you wouldn't mind joining in like an open mic style debate where it's like a radio show. You don't necessarily need to go on webcam or anything like that. Just make sure you got a, a decent mic. Well, pop in. This will be on the fifth. Kent and I, we're just going to discuss the year worth of debates. Uh, it was a ton of fun. We'll probably kick it off with Kent giving a 15 or a minute or 20 minute presentation. And that'll give people the opportunity to join the show. I'll, I'll pull them in backstage one by one. And we'll just have some impromptu uh, discussion with Kent. And anybody's welcome. As long as we keep it respectful, you know, sophisticated. I, I liked tonight's format, especially Evan and Kent. I like how they kept it free flowing. They kept it organic, bouncing ideas off of each other, asking each other questions. You know, there was never a moment where, you know, somebody was talking too long. It was really well balanced. I'll say that. So tonight was a great debate. And that's how I'd like to see it, especially as we move into uh, 2023. And so what else do I have in mind? You know, I'm excited because I love the evolution topic, but I also love the eschatology topic. And so first week of January, we're going to have the great rapture debate. Two pastors here, Pastor Matt First, Pastor Daniel Eldridge. They're going to be debating, is the pre-tribulation rapture biblical? And so this will be the first week of January. We've also got Grayson and Jamie from Studio 215 official. This one is going to be lively. I can already predict it. So Big Bang to Evolution. 
And we've got a diversity. We've got a diversity of topics because we've also got the King James only debate. This will be Turretin fan and Nick Sayers, two season debaters here. Is the King James Bible totally free from all errors? That is the first week of January as well. We've got some debates on soteriology for you. So guys, if you're not yet subscribed, make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell. You're not going to want to miss out on these debates. So this one, the great salvation debate, free grace theology versus, versus lordship, lordship salvation. We got some solid interviews for January as well. Paul Price, He's written uh, a ton on CMI, uh, creationministries.com. He wrote a, an article specifically on Behemoth, which I thought was excellent. And so he's going to join me for a discussion on that. Dr. Dan Biddle is going to be joining me in, in January. Dr. Jerry Bergman, he's going to be joining me in January. And we've got an epic debate here at the end of the month. Is there evidence for the existence of God, Paul Price? And Snake was right. So I'm pumped for this one. I just did an impromptu uh, Christmas Eve debate, I guess you could say. It was late at night. It is up on the channel. You can find it in the live stream section. Myself and Jamie Russell, we it was an informal debate, so more of a discussion, but um, we both had differing views. Anyways, we debated eschatology. Who is the he in Daniel 9, 27? So controversial question in the world of Christianity and eschatology. So Please do check that out. And I think that's pretty much it, guys. So again, we're going to be here. We're going to be back here on Thursday, Kent versus Grayson. Round one of Kent versus Grayson. It's gotten some great feedback. Grayson's always a ton of fun. He comes in swinging. So I know Grayson and Kent are going to have an epic debate. I've debated Grayson a couple times as well. And so that should be a fun one. That's in a couple days. For those who didn't get their question answered uh, tonight, make sure you're here for Thursday. And I'll do my best to take your question and put it at the top of the list. And, and we'll make sure to get your, your questions in there. Okay, guys. So with that, um, that's it. Sam for Truth is out. Thank you so much for tuning in, guys. And we will see you. We will see you soon. God bless all. Awesome.